And I think the really interesting thing is when you tack on where we're headed in the 21st century, and then you've got the last 10,000 doing this today, and then boom, you know, we're just outside the outside the elevator, you know? It's up and out. So I think that's the interesting perspective you get. So let's get to the, the new paper, which is, uh, to me, profoundly interesting, just because it's... It's an effort, essentially, to uh, do the a uh, what's been done for the last two thousand years, right? Uh, using Extended a lot of different sick. use proxies and statistical methods to see if you can get a global temperature uh, change with some accuracy and some some resolution, right? Uh, through 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 ten thousand years, ten, is it tw- is it twelve? Actually, eleven thousand three hundred years. You got it. So that's basically <laughs> the you know the whole the, this whole era we call the Holocene. Yeah, and um, if you could summarize, you, here's your ele- your elevator speech, uh, and Obama is there, and he just said, "So what's this? I hear about this new paper." <laughs> you've right. got thirty seconds to kind of say what you've learned about the temperature in this whole era. Well, that's pressure. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I'm in the elevator with Obama, I mean, what did we learn? We learned that for ten, for eleven thousand three hundred years. Temperatures have been doing a long, subtle, so, slow slide down, and small, you know, half a degree, three quarters of a degree of cooling over the long run of the last several thousand years. Um, and in the last century, they've ticked up that much. You know, the same amount that we've slid down in the last 5,000 years, they've just ticked that much up in the last century. And I think the really interesting thing is when you tack on where we're headed in the 21st century, and then you've got the last 10,000 doing this today, and then boom, you know, we're just outside the outside the elevator, you know. It's up and out. So I think that's the interesting perspective you get. So so a super hockey stick, a really long one. Super hockey stick, yeah, right. Um, so I sent your paper around to a bunch of folks, uh, Michael Mann and uh, um, Rich Muller and his team, who've done a lot of this kind of temperature reconstruction yeah. on a short time scale. And Robert so what do you think? Well, uh, let me give you a couple of questions that came up. One was about <laughs> resolution. Uh, Robert Rode, whose work I'm pretty impressed with, although they've been having a hard time getting their work uh, peer-reviewed and published. Um, but but Rode has done uh, remarkable work with um, looking at patterns through time, and even in ex- extinction rates on another research project. Okay. And he was worried about the time scale issue, you know, when you have this 100 years that we have a very well-instrumented record for. So we know that You've seen this. Um, how, what's the, the state? The, what's the source of the high confidence that there in, there aren't hundred year wiggles Blitz. in there going back? Uh, he he said, "Let me just get the language." Oh God, I think I've got it here. In essence, their reconstruction appears to tell us about past changes in climate with a resolution of about four hundred years. Well, sure. Th- that is more than adequate for gathering insights about millennial scale changes during the last 10,000 years, but it will completely obscure any rapid fluctuations having durations less than a few hundred years. And I didn't know if that's a, you know, is there a way to sort of, and Michael Mann actually nudged toward your sense of um, that through the other analysis you've done, you, you can kind of get some confidence there. But can you explain that a little bit? You, you know, what do you think about that? Well, so I guess a couple of things. Yeah, I respond to both of those to represent to, to, to Michael Mann's point. Um, to, no, to be fair, I don't think we can say for sure there isn't, you know, a little 50-year warm blip in there that was much warmer than today. That that could be hiding in the in the in the data out there. We won't we don't have the resolution for that because we've got a data point every you know in an ocean core a data point every 200 years plus that mud's all mixed around. So when you really get down to it, you might never see that blip. Um, I guess a couple of things to think about that. One, I think we know that the current blip we're on won't just be a blip. You know, it's going to go up and CO2 is going to hang out for quite a long time. So right. it, it will be a long, sustained warming. So if we did have something going on in the Holocene like what we are currently engaging in, I think you'd see it, or at least a, a pretty you know clear trace of it, and, and you don't. Um, but, yeah, absolutely, there could be a you know a little boom, um, and, and you wouldn't know. So then the other thing we did, though, was to say, okay, well, we can map out the sort of lower frequencies, longer-term ups and downs, but, yeah, we're missing all the shorter-term you know chitter-chatter on top of that. So we said, let's just sort of take the whole range that we see from sort of warmest end to coldest end and kind of make a bell curve of here's what temperatures have done over the last 10,000 years. And we can say, well, we know something about how much climate goes up and down on, you know, 
decadal time scale, century time scales, and we can kind of add that on to our bell curve. And that sort of broadens the bell curve. But it doesn't actually broaden it that much. You know, it makes the highs a little higher, the lows a little lower. Um, and so we can sort of do a back of the envelope kind of calculation of you know, how much might that be skewing our, our perspective here. Um, and, and when you do it, it doesn't change your final impression too much. You're still left with saying, okay, we've gone from sort of the low end to the high end in the last century. Yeah. And in this century, we're going to go above and beyond the, you know, the, the sort of range of natural interglacial variability. And I, I guess that gets one question I had was, again, about the robustness of the early Holocene, the level of warmth. Especially, um, can you exclude seasonal issues? I know the summer, can, do you have high confidence in that what was the warmest global mean temperature at that time was where you have it? I think that, in my mind, is probably fairly... Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I mean, can we exclude seasonal effects? I don't. I, I, no, I don't think so. And to some extent, some of these proxies almost certainly are biased towards seasons. You have a pollen record from Alaska. It's probably going to tell you, you know, mostly about summertime, not winter. Um, when you factor that in, I mean, at the end of the day, if I had to tell you what I really think maybe is going on, if I lean one way or the other, my concern isn't so much that the seasonal effects have exaggerated, or sorry, it's not that they're. I think what they've probably done is they've maybe made climate look like it's changed more than it maybe actually has in a mean annual sense. Because if you're skewed to certain seasons, I think seasons have probably changed a lot more than sort of the mean annual. Mm -hmm. and that's because it's going to be driven by you know, things like uh, Milankovitch forcing. So you can change the seasons a lot, but if you make summers, you know, change a lot this way, winters change a lot that way, mean annual, not much has gone on. So my concern is actually more if we have those seasonal effects, they're probably over-exaggerating. Um, the range of variability we've had in the Holocene. Interesting. Now, um, it, so this gets to, I guess, the, the key thing here, as has been the case for a while, including with Muller's work and with Mann's work earlier, is uh, a lot of people focus on the pace of change also being the factor that yeah. should be societally most relevant. Yeah. Again, if you can essentially exclude that there have been jogs uh, of this sort um, through the this, last 12,000 years uh, or so. Um, like the current jog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of interesting. It is. Again, I don't know. I, I think, to be fair, I don't think we can exclude that there have been rapid blips. Rapid blips on the scale that... So we've had a rapid blip of 0.8 degrees so far, right? Which is pretty big, but I don't think we can exclude that. By the end of the century, we're going to have had a rapid blip of, like, 4 degrees. That's... That's getting to be big time now. I, I well, think depending that, on depending on whose sensitivity work you look at. Depending on the sensitivity and the carbon emissions, et cetera, yeah. But um, so say it's two degrees to six degrees, you know, or something. But yeah, um, that's getting that's getting pretty big. Well, I guess the other thing that I think you probably have in the past over the whole scene as well is you probably had some rapid regional scale climate changes. Um, you, know, you can think of like the Green Sahara in the early Holocene, and sure. then you know they really dried out. So that's a big potentially rapid. <laughs> change regionally, um, a global scale rapid change like we've got going on, I, I think that's probably hard to, to, talk, to, to tuck into this data, at least one that really lasted for, for quite a while, like what we're going to have happen. Yeah. And then when you take this to the sort of David Archer, Ray Pierre, Humbert scale, time scale, yeah. you realize that it's not a hockey stick we're talking about. It's, it's something like, what would that be? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't think of. Yeah. We're talking about a very long tail of uh, warmer temperatures as well. Right. Now, that doesn't really relate directly to your work, but can you kind of remind people that this is not a one-time... How do you put that in your own head? Putting the, lo the long, kind of the long perspective here? Yeah. So I view it as... Um, I mean, I think the simplest way to view it, I, I sort of, I'm, for one, I sort of like the idea of the Anthropocene. I think that makes a lot of sense to view it as... This was the Holocene, and then boom, here we go into the Anthropocene. And there'll be a long tail to that, but that's just going to stretch on and on for millennia. So, yeah. Uh, so that, that's, to my mind, that's the simplest way to view it. What's that? Well, I, I'm actually on the Anthropocene working group, the uh, ah. uh, the stratigraphy people. I'm, I'm the one kind of ah. rube in there because I wrote about this in 1992. And, um, but the... Um, 
you know, obviously this would this would be one of those factors people would point to and say, hey, there there it is. It's not in the stratigraphy necessarily, but it's certainly right. you would say that in the climate record you'd be able, you'd be able, be able to look at a very time, long time scale and say, that's yeah. us. I think so. And when I give this talk to people and I show them this result, I plot the data up and you look at it and I think they instantly, it just it resonates with people's minds. You say the Anthropocene, this is clearly a new phase here and everybody... Ah, yeah, they, you know, it hits home. People, I think people get that. It resonates.